Okay, uh, I think you'll you'll start now. So um, a big welcome to everyone who has joined us for Big Data, Little Data, No Data, who is in charge of data quality, uh, which is the ninth in the ICSU World Data System webinar series. Um, and we are delighted to have two speakers with us today who will jointly give us this presentation. Um, firstly, we have uh, Christine Borgman, uh, a distinguished professor and presidential chair in information studies at the University of California, Los Angeles, and who directs the Center for Knowledge Infrastructures. Uh, in addition to being on numerous panels and boards, Christine is the author of more than 250 publications in information studies, computer science, and communication. Uh, including the 2015 book, Big Data, Little Data, No Data, Scholarship in the Networked World, a winner of the 2015 American Prose Award in Computing and Information Sciences, and which has undoubtedly inspired the title of today's talk. Uh, alongside Christine, we have uh, Dr. Andre uh, Andrea Scharnhorst, uh, who is Head of Research and Innovation at Data Archiving and Network Services, DANS, um, which is an institute of uh, uh, NOR and NO in the Netherlands and uh, is a regular member of the ICSU World Data System. Uh, although Andrea has a background in physics and philosophy of science, her current work is part of the information sciences, in particular chairing the ECOS No, no Escape Action. Uh, together with Christine Singh, she's involved in a project looking at DANS users which I think we will hear a little more about in a few moments' time. Um, before I hand over to Christine and Andrea, uh, a quick reminder that you can add questions to the end of the presentation anytime through the uh, question and answer panel. Um, please use the chat panel for any technical issues. Uh, so just for me to say thank you again and to hand over to Andrea to start. Uh, so let me do that. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Rory, for the nice introduction. Um, and we decided that I kick off um, our webinar, and I'm very pleased that uh, Christine made it. She just yesterday arrived uh, from the US. So the reason we have set up that is that everybody talks about data as a new gold and a new source for knowledge. And it's also an imperative for researchers to reuse data. So everybody should share their data, reuse their data. And it's actually very easy, new technologies like Dropbox, like Google Drive, make it very easy to drop data. But it's not so easy to actually find data and then find the right data. And it is uh, on the desk of the libraries and the archives, the network organizations like WDS, CoData, the Research Data Alliance, who try to come in there, devote time to sort out actually who is responsible for data creation, what would be good practices. And as part of that, and that is something I see my colleagues at DUNS and also in European infrastructures also being a bit puzzled, as part of that there is an expectation that the archives also take care of the quality of the data, similar like the editors of journals do this for the articles. Now, how is a librarian or an archivist or a documentalist going to do this? This is actually the reason we put this event together, and again, are delighted that Christine is able to share. Thank you, Andrea, for the wonderful introduction, and to Rory also. Um, let's. Uh, one more thank you is in order, which is to uh, Ingrid Dillo, who thought that this would be a good way to kick off um, Don's participation in the World Data Systems uh, Group. And uh, it also is a nice way to tie together the work that I've been doing. I uh, started coming here a couple of years ago as a visiting scholar through the, the Royal, uh, Royal Academy. And uh, I started asking questions such as this about data quality, and that led to a, a research project that I'm back for the third or fourth time to work on, and we'll talk about that a bit more at the end of um, the session. So here we are. Uh, we've got the cover slide, and I'll just move through them from here. Uh, let's first talk a little bit about what's meant by data. The, probably the hardest part of thinking about data quality is that people don't agree in the first place on what our data 
one person's signal tends to be someone else's noise, as we found in the 15 years or so that we've been out in the field studying scientists and people in other disciplines who are trying to make sense of their own data as we follow them around with their data practices. This uh, slide with the big data on it, that is a definition of big data that's been around for oh, a good number of years now, at least 15. And what's useful about this is to show that uh, data can be large in many respects. It's not just the volume, it's the speed at which they're coming at you, the velocity, uh, the speed at which they change, and the variety or heterogeneity of the data. All of those contribute to complexity and the more complex, the harder it is to maintain some kind of data quality. Another common metaphor you see is this one about the long tail of data. And that one is similarly reductionist in that it suggests that some, a small number of researchers, typically scientists, have large volumes of data and many people have much smaller volumes of it. But of course, any field or any science is much more complex than just those two dimensions. The OECD criteria, which are nearly a decade old now, 2007, these have been widely disseminated around the world. And generally, we talk about the data in um, archives, such as those in the World Data Systems, or we think about data quality, we're concerned with making those data open in, in some respect or another. Now, open can mean many things. This list of 13 criteria that they put forth um, at that time suggests how complex it is to make data open. You cannot possibly release any data set or even deposit a data set that meets all of these criteria at once. So generally speaking, you're going to need to make some priorities and some trade-offs between these things depending on the local circumstances. Why is it that we want to sustain data or access to research data in the first place? Well, we might want to do so for a number of different reasons. Uh, first of all, if it's observational data, you may want to keep it because you cannot reconstruct them again. For example, you can, you know, that those Chandra uh, observations in the sky, you know, certainly you can go back and see things that are stable again, but the sky is constantly changing and you can only capture what happened at that time and place by keeping those data. You may want them for reference models. We found that in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, for example that uh, in addition to using those data as uh, for observational purposes to do other kinds of studies, they are considered so accurate and of such high quality that later sky surveys and later projects and people even building their own instruments will go back to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey as a point of reference to calibrate their own particular projects or ways to uh, ways to collect and manage the data. Reproducibility is a hot topic in all fields, but it's a particularly problematic one because people don't agree on what's reproducibility, what's repeatability, what's verifiability, and so on, and how far back to the beginning of a project one might have to go to make something reproducible. Most often of all, you may want to keep data so that you can aggregate multiple sources that would get you to a different kind of way of keeping them to make them more interoperable or ways they could be, say, combined. Uh, the next two parts are on users and time frame, uh, the difficulty of maintaining data quality um, is going to, uh, there we go. See, we sit still and the lights go off. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, if you're going to keep them for the investigator, uh, that's hard enough, but then it's more labor to make them useful to collaborators who may not have been involved in the original collection and making them available to third parties is yet more difficult. Similarly, keeping data for some months is uh, 
a challenge, but keeping them for years, for decades, much less for centuries, uh, is something we don't yet know how to do for digital data. So we can simplify the challenge somewhat. That's not to say that the challenge is simple in any respect. A couple more slides from our own research that show you some of the different kinds of parameters that we're looking at as far as how our scientists make data and use data and evaluate them. Uh, this particular contrast between big science and little science is, is also reductionist that most sciences fall somewhere in between, but rather is the idea that things like astronomy, you have projects that take decades to accomplish, very large amounts of money, and many people are involved in them over large distributed arrays. The result is a highly centralized approach to data collection. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the large synoptic survey telescope that we're studying, you find a decade or more may be spent on designing the data archive and the data collection process to assure that those data can be useful for much longer periods of time. Conversely, if you look at the more small science, which would be the most of science, most of scholarship, with small teams and local work, those data are collected at individual places in a highly decentralized way where each team or even each individual researcher is collecting his or her data with local protocols, local methods, local instruments. And then when we try to put things into data archives later, we have to reconcile them at that point. That turns out to be a much more difficult challenge. That comparison between centralized and decentralized is one of the main themes that we're looking at in our current research at UCLA as we look across a number of different sciences, some of which are more centralized and some more decentralized. This next slide uh, is the definition of data that I ended up with in the book. And this is probably you know, 10 or 15 years worth of thinking about how data uh, become data, how things become data in different people's work, is to say that they're representations and something becomes data only when you use it as evidence for your research or for your scholarship. What this does is recognize that determining something to be data is itself a scholarly act. And that's part of why it's so difficult to standardize data production and data coordination across projects. How are we going to sustain these data? And you see that iceberg on uh, the right where you've got a small amount of data at the top and large amounts of metadata being really the underneath the, the, the real weight of the iceberg. If you're getting, say, a publication, a journal article, then what, you've, um, what you want to do generally is to read it with your eyes, although nowadays people are going to do more mining of those. If you're getting a data set, it's not enough to have that rows of numbers in your hand. You need to be able to identify what they mean, identify the form, the content, more context, objects that are related to them, code books, protocols, instrumentation, software, particularly software. We are finding in our research that if you don't have the software, you don't have the data generally. And so, there's so much customized software that it's um, part of the, the difficulty of data preservation is preserving the software in some consistent ways. And again, that's one of the research questions that we're pursuing in the uh, UCLA work from the Center for Knowledge Infrastructures. Um, this slide excuse me, is uh, from a project that is currently in process called the Stewardship Gap 
and the, the uh, URL and the site are there on the bottom. This is a project uh, funded by the Sloan Foundation, led by Myron Gutman of the University of Colorado and uh, Francine Berman, the head of the Research Data Alliance, uh, to look at what are the gaps between the way stewardship is done now and what really needs to be done for long-term sustainability. Uh, and this, I'm an advisor to the project, and we just met in New York last week. There, uh, this is based on, oh, say, 15 or 20 interviews in the first round. But already this interesting model is emerging that the way people judge value has at least these half dozen different dimensions. The first one being culture. What are the community norms and goals? around what data are worth keeping and why. How much knowledge does the community have about stewardship? We often find, for example, that people don't know the difference between backing up data and stewarding it or curating it for the long term. Responsibility is something that also has come up a great deal in our UCLA research that data often aren't deposited because the team can't decide who's really in charge, who should take responsibility for doing so. Who is the author of a journal article is something that is negotiated, but the uh, control over the data uh, less so. Whether long-term commitments are made, you know, people say, I, pr I, I preserve my data, I back it up, but that's very different from saying, I have a commitment to transfer it to an archive, for example, one for the World Data System. The resources vary wildly, not just the money, but the skill base, and what kinds of actions are being taken. All of those come together to think about value in data. This is going to be a, I think a useful framework as we go forward to begin to examine um, data value and data practices. The next slide about when to invest in data is a, a very library-centric view that suggests that we have a virtuous circle around the production and use and reuse of data, that people plan projects, they implement, they publish, they preserve, and they're reused and to go into other projects. This is certainly an idealistic model. We don't have as much evidence as we might like that this happens consistently. What we do know is the earlier in the process that people begin to take some responsibility about long-term investment in their data, the more likely it is to survive. So if you begin by laying out your code book and your protocol in such a way that you're collecting data consistently and storing them as you go, that is more likely to uh, begin to promote um, a, large, a longer term cycle. It's an interesting contrast to this next uh, one that I grabbed from a finance group at you know, University of Michigan, which is, you know, again, one of the major research universities. And from a finance and an ethics and a compliance perspective, the project starts with finding funding and ends, in, ends when the, say, the grant ends. You close out the project, you're done, and they go on to the next one. So, that is a model that says financially that's all we care about. There's nothing in there that supports data stewardship. So that also tells you where the value lies depending on the different stakeholders. So we would want to negotiate with different stakeholders for uh, different roles. Um, now let's spend a few minutes uh, talking about the project that we have underway here at uh, Don's. When I came here as a, a visiting scholar initially uh, and started asking questions, uh, which I'll give you in a moment, uh, it turned into something from an interesting conversation into something that uh, really was worthy of substantial time and investment, which we're now doing on, on two continents. And we'll also hope that we're building a model that will um, allow us to set it up so that other people can use our protocol and make those reusable to compare across different archives. So it's the two of us, um, Hank Vandenberg and Peter Dorn of Adon's uh, 
Milena Gulch and, and Ashley Sands, two of my research team, and then uh, two other well-known scholars, Herbert Van de Sample and Andrew Trelore have been working with us on some parts of this project also. Uh, the next slide, the research question. This was really the beginning of the conversation when um, it came to me in uh, comparing what Don's was doing as the archive, but a particularly unusual archive in that it does have a research operation uh, wrapped around it. They do a number of interesting projects in addition to the usual roles of collecting uh, data and serving data, is to say, you know, where do these data come from? Who are these people who contribute their content and, and their, you know, their life's work to this archive? And when do they do it? At what stage of the project? Why do they do it? How do they do it? And, you know, what does it get them? What are the effects and the reasons? Uh, and similarly, who acquires or consumes data? Who are the people at that end? And when in their stage of the project do they do it? Why do they do it? And what becomes the data? What, how are they willing to exploit them? We also have questions about the overlap between uh, those two groups. Is it the same people who contribute and consume, or are they completely different communities? Uh, and then thirdly, and this is one that um, like Andrea and Andrew Trelore really uh, pulled out into the fore, is to look at the role the archivists play. And we had been looking at the archives a bit more as a black box and not as a very active environment, which we're seeing that it, that it is, of how much time is being spent by those archivists in soliciting data and managing them and curating them and then reaching out and matching uh, data to, to potential users. Uh, so the, the model, and here let me take you to the model on the next, uh, this diagram here on the next page, uh, that is that we're seeing this set of relationships between the archivist as the bridge to both the contributors and the consumers Don's being the archive, and actually particular parts of Don, in between. And that you've got these data sets that would move over time from being contributed to data archives and to being selected for reuse at the other end. So we want to look at both ends of those processes in much more depth about where those data come from, where they end up, and um, how and why they get there. Uh, I also want to reiterate as part of this uh, study that we are not doing an evaluation of Don's. Rather, Don's has very graciously agreed to be um, a site for a case study. Also, that we have uh, been working through the web logs, and that's the part that Hank Vandenberg brings to this, uh, this particular project. And we're finding that the web logs were designed for you know, managing system uptime and system security. They were not designed for doing really research on. So it's been a considerable amount of labor just coming up with a way to get a sample from this process. And we have a, uh, we have a couple of posters and a short paper out already talking about some of the difficulty of how you use things like web logs to figure out who, who your users are. So we're hoping to make contributions at, at several stages of this process. Uh, so far, we've interviewed all of the archivists and about half of the contributors and half the consumers that we want to. Um, Andrea and I are going to get um, more of our interviews done this week and next week while I'm in the Netherlands. And uh, over the summer, we hope to do a good bit of writing. So you can look, uh, we hope to say next fall or so for fuller uh, discussion. But we do have a couple of short pieces. There's two posters at ACES uh, this past year, for example. Work in progress. Uh, this other substantive slide that I do want to spend a couple of minutes on is to think about the economics. And I spent a good bit of time on, in the book about the economics of data use and um, access to data and the role of data archives in, in data quality and just plain stewardship. The uh, rows and columns come from fairly classic economics. The exclusion, whether it's difficult or easy, is you, know, you can't people, keep people out of beautiful sunsets or beautiful beaches very easily. Um, but you can certainly keep them out of libraries and you can keep them out of uh, paid subscription journals. 
the subtractability or the rivalry is uh, what happens when someone has something, does it take away from the other? And information goods are generally fairly low on that, uh, that spectrum because more people can use the same information and it gathers value rather than reducing value. Common pool resources are those in the top right corner where it's difficult to exclude and the, the rivalry is, is considered high. Uh, common pool resources are anything that really needs to be governed and that has a problem with what's called free riders. That is, if you just put them out there at no cost, people will, will take and they won't have much incentive to give. How do you find a way for people to give or contribute on an equitable basis? Who gets to govern the process? Who gets to make the decisions? And how much money is going to get paid by each group to keep things like individual data archives or the DOMs or other members of the world data systems um, or coordinated? And that, that approach appears to be the most viable for the community in the long run rather than saying going completely public goods where you just throw things out there and say you can have them. That we, that's not worked very well. Uh, the club goods, locking them down and paying a subscription to them is, uh, doesn't appear it's going to work that well. And a whole lot of data are simply uh, private goods. They're things that stay inside people's offices, on their, their spreadsheets, on their computers, and never really gets, get shared. So it's the common pool of resources that we're concerned about. No data is the third part of the title of the book, and that's the case where uh, data are just plain not available for, for use. Maybe they were never captured well enough that they could be released. Maybe they were in fairly good shape but uh, they were not released. Or maybe they're released and out there in, in an archive, but they're not usable. The metadata is not good enough. The software is not available, whatever, the code books aren't clear enough, whatever other reasons. And probably the majority of today's research data would fall in one of these three categories. Relatively little, it appears, of all the scientific data being produced are actually readily available. What we really want to be doing is thinking in terms of building knowledge infrastructures. And infrastructures are not um, simple, they're not clean, they're not neat, they're much messier like we have in this image from a workshop that we did a couple of years ago with funding from the National Science Foundation and the Alpha Peace Loan Foundation that shows you've got lots of string and bailing wire, old technologies and new technologies, and a lot of people working together just to make those pieces fit. So we're going to have old technologies and new and old standards and new as we go forward. Lastly, here is the outline of the, the Big Data, Little Data, No Data book. And uh, the first part of it, the first four chapters, really lay out the framework, the provocations, why we're having this conversation now, what's changing in the world of scholarship, uh, frames the idea of data scholarship and particularly the, the diversity to show how different data are from one field to the next and one, uh, one domain to the next, how difficult it is to get common standards. The middle part has uh, extensive case studies in group by the sciences, the social sciences, and then uh, the humanities, and those range from uh, sensor networks and astronomy through to museum collections and uh, the Pisa Griffin in art history and uh, Buddhist, Chinese Buddhist philology. So there's sort of something for everyone in there. Um, the, much of the book was written when I was in residence at the University of Oxford at Balliol, the Oxford Internet Institute and the E-Research Center. And uh, many of the, the case studies are uh, largely drawn from some of the work going on there in combination with our last decade of work at UCLA. The last part is bringing it all together and thinking more broadly about the behavior issues and economics issues of releasing, sharing, and reusing data, uh, the credit attribution and discovery. This is an important area in things like software citation and data citation. Are we concerned with those? 
to give credit to people, to attribute the source, or to improve the discovery of data, and lastly, what to keep and why. And that's where the real value questions uh, tend, tend to come in, is the, the scientists and the scholars aren't sure themselves what's worth keeping. They often say, I don't know why any, anyone would ever want to use these again. They often defer to librarians and archivists, and librarians and archivists tend to say uh, that's a domain decision, not a professional information uh, decision, it shouldn't be our choice to make it. So there's a lot of circular conversations going on. We're at a critical stage here and uh, much, much to talk about. So I hope that the book proves useful to a, a broad audience. It's getting very nice reception in multiple communities already. So let me stop there. And Andrea has been taking notes. She may have a question or two to add. And um, Rory said he was going to combine the uh, uh, the questions from our attendees, which apparently is a record-setting number, delighted to know. So, all right, uh, Rory, is that back to you or back to Andrea? Um, well, firstly, let me thank you very much for the wonderful and very interesting talk. And uh, you are exactly on time, so it's uh, even better. Uh, so we have uh, about 15 minutes left uh, for question and answers. Um, in fact, um, We've got only one question at the moment, so I assume people are still having a little think, so we'll maybe let them think a little longer. And um, while they do that, um, maybe if uh, Andrea has some uh, words she'd like to add, then uh, that would be very welcomed. Thanks. Now, what, what was going through my head, uh, Christine, when you were talking is that you compared the centralized approach to the decentralized, to decentralized approach. And we at DANS, we are situated in the social sciences and humanities, but in those areas, we quite cover various communities. So we are kind of in the middle of that. What would be the bottom line? What would be the, the minimum of things we can do to actually ensure a good description, a good documentation of the data we have? What do you think is the, is the way to go? Well, Don definitely falls in the, the decentralized range because uh, you are a fairly broad kind of archive in terms of the number of different kinds of disciplines and an array of sources of data um, that that you have. And um, given, given that, uh, I'm going to find this over here. Um, I'll turn this to you for a moment. Okay. Um, um, and and given, given the breadth of um, kinds of data and users, that are involved, uh, you have the difficult problem of having individual data sets. And that's also common with things like ICPSR, the Inter University Consortium for Political and Social Research, is they are focused on wrapping a whole code book and software around the data, uh, but they don't expect to really be able to merge different surveys directly, uh, whereas the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, they spent a decade producing one very great archive, but even there they release it a decade at a time, uh, sorry, uh, one, about one year's data release at a time. Your question was more about like what's the appropriate lowest common denominator. And that's I think one of the biggest challenges that we have is certainly there's some you know, basic cataloging about code books and software and tools that they all have to have. But you know, at the bottom level, you would want something very specific for archaeology, very specific for statistics, very specific for census. Um, and at the higher level, you'd want to be able to just throw it all in and make sense of it later. The sweet spot's going to be somewhere in between the, the, level, the level of abstraction uh, this meeting last week at the uh, Sloan Foundation headquarters in New York, the Stewardship Gap, uh, Vince Cerf, one of the, um, he and Bob Kahn uh, were the ones that wrote TCPIP and you know, so the, the basic layer for internet protocols. And uh, Dr. Cerf was comparing the uh, digital stewardship problem 
to what they had done with the uh, original protocols for the internet. And he said that we had these four different, you know, packet switching and radio and others. And they decided what they need to do was go up a level of abstraction, not build on features unique to each of them, but a layer that would work across them. And what's happened several decades later is all four of those have fallen away. And yet the broader abstraction layer that they built has lived on. And uh, it was a very interesting conversation about whether we can think of digital stewardship in something comparable to finding the right layer of abstraction. Okay. Maybe we have some more questions and answers in the in the chat. Yes, we do. So um, we've got a couple of couple of nice questions here. So let's uh, let's have uh, take these. Um, so we've got the first one is from uh, David Moroni, and the question is with regards to software being essential for data preservation, which type of software is being considered? Data pro processing algorithms, read software, or both? I would say all of all of the above. Um, uh, there's some very interesting projects, uh, David. If you're interested in that uh, particular problem, being led by a group at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, led by Jim Herb's lab, and some related work at University of Texas at Austin uh, by Jim How or, you know, James Howison's group, where they're looking at how the scientific community works to sustain its own, um, its own software. Uh, some of the things that we have observed in our studies of science is that uh, researchers will make minor changes in an algorithm with every single run of the instrument. And they often don't keep very good track of them, so it's very difficult to reproduce or reuse the data because you've got to know what change with each, uh, with each element as they go. The, uh, the workflow processing, uh, things like Taverna and the work that uh, Carol Goebel at Manchester and uh, Dave DeRoar at Oxford are doing where you can start to capture the, the workflow as you go in a uh, machine readable way. Those are important to capture. But I think it's uh, sort of all of the above is, is the problem. So maybe I can maybe I can add to that, uh, David. So we are currently in a research infrastructure in the Netherlands called Claria, which is uh, which uh, stands for a large infrastructure research infrastructure for the social sciences and humanities. The kind of combination of Clarin, so the computer linguistic part, which are pioneers. We have an automatic system which thinks <laughs> on its own here, um, and the and Daria, so the digital humanities uh, branch in Europe, and we are looking into uh, software sustainability as part of or connected uh, to data quality and data sustainability, and then uh, it's very useful to look into software sustainability criteria in the software producing, software engineering kind of branch and the uh, UK Institute for Software Sustainability is a, is, a, is a beautiful source of all kind of guidelines and practices and they very near also work with industry standards. But at, uh, in practice, I think what we also see is that if software is really used, yeah, if tooling is used, uh, then that's the best guarantee to actually still have the tooling and the data connected to it or produced with it actually active. And what we're trying to do is to think about selection criteria, what kind of software we wanted to have as meticulously documented as possible, and what kind of software we say, that's experimentation, that's kind of lab experiment you build and then you deconstruct again. Let's go on to the next one, because we've only got a few minutes. Okay, so the next one is from someone I'm sure you will know well, uh, Jean-Bernard Minster, uh, who asks, uh, the book only discusses scientific data, social sciences, and humanities. It seems that health data, particularly public health data, should be part of the mix. Only 2% of all clinical data 
ever collected are actually uh, contributed to trusted repositories? Well, um, thank you for that, Jean Bernard. Uh, the I have lumped uh, health data under the sciences. So it's really sort of science, technology, medicine, and health in there, and uh, not gone into much uh, depth on, uh, on health, but I do have some things in there from, say, the Structural Genomics Consortium that I was working with um, out of Oxford. Uh, and then the other, um, uh, of course, there's a lot of good medical work going on there also. Uh, I think it's the 2% the of clinical data are actually contributed. That's a very worrisome, uh, a very worrisome number, of course, and, um, and a big push. I was at the um, Library of Congress on uh, Thursday and Friday, and uh, we had a symposium on some biomedical research there, and I asked those clinicians from parts of our National Institutes of Health about their practices on sharing uh, clinical trial data. And I got a, um, a surprisingly defensive response in that, on the one hand, they acknowledge that they're now required to release the clinical trial data. On the other hand, they have uh, one set of systems for intramural data another set for extramural data, another set that they fill out for their um, human subjects protection, another that they fill out for their grant proposals, and they can't even get interoperability and release between the NIH ones that they're working with, which really, that, that surprised me, but, um, but on the other hand, given our experience in other kinds of sciences where people have a hard time even working side by side and getting them to interoperate is uh, not, um, so I guess it shouldn't be that surprising. It's very, it's very difficult to get data in a form to submit, and even once you do get it submitted, uh, people may not trust it or be able to make enough sense of it to reuse it. Yes, uh, uh, certainly from a, a WDS perspective, we, uh, we have a lot of interest in uh, the health sciences and health data, and it's a very, very tricky problem, um, one that we hope to look at and move into more in the future, which, uh, um, and as regards that, I would say to the people on, uh, online, uh, watch this space, because we hope to have some, um, some webinars that actually address this in the coming months. So uh, hopefully those of you with an interest in that area will have some of your questions answered. Um, so uh, we're, we're almost out of time, I think. So um, do you have any last words, uh, Christine or uh, Andrea, from, from your side? Uh, yes, actually, Roy, I would like to answer that question from Hank Corton, if I might, about the uh, the conceptualization of scientific article based on a certain data set and whether that should be linked um, as the metadata. Uh, the short answer is yes, absolutely. The journal article is very important, not only metadata, but that is the framing of the argument. And uh, scholars make arguments using, uh, using data. Journal articles are much more than simply containers of data. On the other hand, I think the role of archives is much more than just taking data sets that are attached to individual articles. We find that you've got a many-to-many -many relationship between a research project and um, journal articles and data sets. People will, con will collect data for decades and slice them and dice them in many different ways uh, for individual articles. So that one-to-one -one mapping will not, will often not get you something that's aggregated anywhere near um, a true reproduction or re reusability of the data. So I think we need to be thinking in terms of many different kinds of, of models. Okay. Could I could I add something to Peter's uh, question? Because I'm also often I also sometimes think so. Where are the where are the beautiful buildings? So where is the stability in all of that? And I think what the what 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 the challenge we are kind of facing 
and that's probably also a common sense, is that um, it's not so much in the building. I mean, digital data are not in the building. They're not hold in the building. But there needs to be some stability, and that's also in terms of skills and capacities. So if you're kind of mixing the people around all the time, yeah, if you don't have a professional education, which gives you gives you a kind of a good a good uh, diploma or degree that you actually know what you are doing. If we if we lose this, if it becomes a well, that, that, one top on one top off job, then we're losing it all. If that needs to be in one institution, in one building with bricks around that, I'm not sure about that. But I think the skills we should uh, defend like a fortress. <laughs> what do you think? I think that that is the knowledge infrastructure. The knowledge infrastructure is the people. It's the computing networks, it's the sets of skills, and it's the set of social conventions that go with this. And so we are very much in a state of rethinking the whole infrastructure, and that's uh, the, the argument of the 350-page book is to really walk us through how we're at a stage of rethinking the knowledge infrastructure uh, for scholarship and where data and publications fit into that and what the next generation is going to have to uh, solve. So that's probably a good um, last comment. Um, is there anything else you would like us to cover, uh, Rory? Uh, no, I don't think so. So that was um, Peter Pulsifer's question, I assume, that you were, were addressing now, which came in right at, right at the last minute. Is that, that correct? Yes, yes. Yes, and yeah. now we uh, just wanted to, to mention to the because uh, I don't think the the people uh, online can actually see it. So the actual question was: Considering that we live in an increasingly networked world with many distributed systems being established or conceptualized, what are your thoughts on the future con uh, of the concept of centralized? Uh, where will bricks and mortar in, uh, bricks and mortar institutions fit? So um, yeah, that was uh, that was what we were just discussing about. So. Uh, Thank you very much for, for seeing that one. It was, uh, it was a slightly delayed coming up on my list. Um, but again, I think that's a nice point to, to stop. We're already very slightly over time. So um, it just remains to, to thank you both once again. So thank you, Andrea, and thank you, Christine, for, again, an incredibly interesting talk. And thank you to everybody uh, our audience who joined today, I hope you, you also found it of interest, and we will obviously make sure that this is uh, archived and put online uh, afterwards, um, and uh, notifications will go out about that. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, like I say, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Bye from Amsterdam. Bye-bye, <laughs> everybody. Thank you.